And in my take at 10, Rishi Sunak's ban on smoking is the nanny state in overdrive. It's illiberal. It won't work, and it's a waste of police time. Stick that in your pipe and smoke it. So, two hours of big opinion, big debate, and plenty of entertainment along the way. A very busy two hours. I'll see you after the news with Ray Anderson. Thanks, Mark, and good evening to you. Our top story this hour. The Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, says the UK is ready to provide any support that Israel needs after it was attacked by the terrorist organisation Hamas. Now, those of you watching on TV can see live footage of Gaza now, where Israel says 800 Hamas targets have been hit, killing hundreds of fighters with dozens more captured. Earlier, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said they will turn anywhere Hamas terrorists are hiding into, quote, an island of ruins. He also urged the people of Gaza to leave those areas immediately. More than 700 Israelis were killed and more than 1,500 injured in yesterday's surprise attack. Nathaniel Young, a 20-year-old British man serving in the Israeli army, was also killed. At least 400 Palestinians have died after Hamas fired thousands of rockets and gunmen stormed the border. The scenes that we've seen in Israel over the past 36 hours are truly horrifying. I want to express my absolute solidarity for the people of Israel. Now is not a time for equivocation, and I'm unequivocal. Hamas and the people who support Hamas are fully responsible for this appalling act of terror, for the murder of civilians and for the kidnapping of innocent people, including children. I've just spoken with Prime Minister Netanyahu to assure him of the UK's steadfast support. Lieutenant Colonel Richard Hecht is the IDF's international spokesperson. He described the scene on the ground. The visuals are uh, ISIL visuals. In a way, this is our 9-11. This is our 9-11. And, you know, even more than that, I mean, it wasn't crashing into a building. It's uh, also mutilating and attacking a party that was happening around the, the Gaza Strip, a nature party, uh, attacking civilians, kidnapping a grandmother. Number 10 has projected the Israeli flag onto Downing Street. Sharing the image on X, the Prime Minister said it showed solidarity with the people of Israel. It comes after the flag was flashed onto several public locations in the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv. The flag has also been shared on public buildings in cities around the world, including Berlin and New York. Well, GB News understands that Labour plans to appoint a COVID corruption commissioner if the party wins the next general election. The new role is designed to help recoup billions of pounds of taxpayers' money lost during the pandemic. Labour believes there were cases of waste, fraud and flawed contracts. Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves is, is expected to make the announcement. This is GB News across the UK on TV, in your car, on digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying, play GB News. Now let's get back to Mark. Thanks, Ray. See you in an hour. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. In my big opinion, woke leftist apologists are deafening in their silence about the appalling carnage in Israel. Why is it so hard to condemn terrorism? In the big story as they launch their last party conference before the election, is this Labour's moment? My Mark Meets guest is ex-Tory MP and the best-selling chick lit author Louise Mensch, who's been described as an unhinged British witch by none other than Vladimir Putin. In my take of 10, Rishi Sunak's ban on smoking is the nanny state in overdrive. It's illiberal, it won't work, and it's a waste of police time. Stick that in your pipe and smoke it. Plus, as they also had their conference this weekend, could Reform UK become the main party of the right if the Conservatives collapse at the next election? I'll be asking tonight's newsmaker, politics legend and member of Reform UK, a woman who wowed her audience at conference yesterday, Anne Whittacombe. Plus, we've got tomorrow's front pages at 10.30 sharp with three top pundits who haven't been told what to say and who don't follow the script. Tonight, former Labour MP Sean Woodward ex-Brexit party MEP Annunciata Rees-Mogg and Fleet Street legend Neil Wallace. 
Tonight, I'll be asking the pundits, is Peter Mandelson right that Keir Starmer is the new Tony Blair? Plus, are Labour's radical plans for housing realistic? And the most important part of the show, your emails. They come straight to my laptop, mark at gbnews.com. And this show has a golden rule. We don't do boring, not on my watch. I just won't have it. A big two hours to come. We start with my big opinion. The usual suspect woke leftist commentators could always be trusted to pick the wrong side of any argument. And they won't be winning the Read the Room Award for their response to yesterday's appalling terrorist attack on Israel. Here is one, one of their flock, Rivka Brown of Novara Media, had to say. Today, she said, should be a day of celebration for supporters of democracy and human rights worldwide as Gazans break out of their open-air prison and Hamas fighters cross into their colonizers' territory. She goes on, the struggle for freedom is rarely bloodless and we shouldn't apologize for it. Wow, quite the hot take. I hate to remind this experienced journalist that she's talking about Hamas, a group recognized as a terrorist organization by the British government a group who bulldozed their way through the Israeli border, went from house to house, murdering innocent civilians, kidnapping children and elderly people, and firing rockets indiscriminately at cities. There's the ritual humiliation of dead Israeli soldiers, and then there is the 30-year-old woman, Shani Luke, a German citizen visiting Israel to attend a music festival for peace held near the Gaza border fence. She was murdered by Hamas, and her dead body paraded on the back of a pickup truck driven by Palestinian terrorists to a cheering crowd. This isn't a struggle for freedom. This is a war crime. Women being raped, children being murdered, elderly civilians taken hostage. But what do we get from the man who almost became our Prime Minister, Jeremy Corbyn? Well, he calls for an immediate ceasefire and an urgent de-escalation. Any condemnation of Hamas themselves? Of course not. What about the Labour MP, Apsana Begum, who posed with a Palestinian campaign group just hours after this appalling attack? A group who later that day went on to blame Israel for this shocking violence. Nice. What about the ultra-woke mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, who again fails to tweet his condemnation of this terror attack? on innocent people, instead tweeting about how the violence in the Middle East can lead to a rise in hate crime in London. I'm so confused, I thought he said that multiculturalism was a roaring success. His office now say that he condemns the Hamas attack, but I'm waiting for the tweets. After all, he's always on his smartphone. And Sadiq Khan loves his campaigns, shining images of political messages onto London landmarks. Why were none of the capital's monuments illuminated with the Israeli flag last night in the way that they were in Berlin, New York and Rome, you tell me. And where was the condemnation from the mayor of horrific scenes in the capital with people waving the Palestinian flag and celebrating the carnage and the murder of innocent civilians? This shocking footage courtesy of the countdown presenter Rachel Riley. Where's the condemnation? There were lots of write-on celebrities and radio and TV hosts who live on Twitter who have been strangely quiet over the last 24 hours, deafening in their silence. You know who they are. Where is the condemnation of these medieval monsters? Welcome to the selective morality of the woke left. This is Israel's 9-11 moment and the biggest massacre against Israeli civilians in the history of their country. But it doesn't merit so much as a tweet from the North London Negroni swilling elite. The BBC haven't helped by talking about the scale and ferocity of attacks on both sides. Tell that to the innocent Israelis dragged out of their homes at the crack of dawn and shot in cold blood. Attacks on both sides? There are no words. Plus, they platformed a so-called Palestinian educator who told BBC News that the scenes yesterday were legitimate and moral. Where do you go from there? The rape, murder and mutilation of innocent people is not enough 
for the usual suspect Liberals to step out of their echo chamber and condemn these crimes against humanity. Why? Because whilst Israel understandably retaliated for this appalling attack, it seems the war against anti-Semitism will never end. Uh, your reaction, I think there are notable figures in the media who have been deafeningly silent on this issue. Let me know your thoughts, mark at gbnews.com. I'll get to your email shortly, but first my top pundits. Former Labour MP Sean Woodward, ex-Brexit Party MEP Annunciata Rees-Mogg and Fleet Street legend Neil Wallace. Uh, let me start with you, Annunciata. A number of figures deafening in their silence. I, in one way, I can understand the silence, that it is so horrific that what is there to say? There are no words to convey what is happening on the ground in Israel at the moment in the Gaza Strip. However, they have a public duty and they have a public duty to support uh, those who are attacked brutally. The images we've seen, and a lot of them I can't even bear to look at, the absolute horror that has been going on, <coughs> completely innocent lives being wiped in horrifically cruel ways, dragged away, screaming, bloodied. It is in no way justifiable, whatever the political situation is and whatever you think of the political situation, there is no way in which you can condone the actions that have taken place in the last 36, 48 hours. Well, indeed, plenty of people, Sean, have demonstrated sympathy, including Jeremy Corbyn, but no direct condemnation of Hamas, who he previously described as friends. Well, let, let's be clear. Jeremy Corbyn is no longer in the Labour Party. He's standing as an independent MP. Keir Starmer now leads the Labour Party. And this morning, 12 hours ago, Keir Starmer was unequivocal. He said Labour stands firmly in support of Israel. It is right that Israel defends itself. It is right that Israel rescues its hostages. And it's right that Israel defends its citizens. And he was unequivocal. This is a terrorist attack. That's subsequently been endorsed by the uh, Shadow Foreign Secretary, David Lammy. Subsequently this evening, where Streeting has been out there talking about the fact that if people are saying things in the UK that might be hate crimes, he thinks the police should investigate them. Nobody in the leadership of this Labour Party, in any shape or form, believes this is anything other than an outrageous, disgusting, cowardly terrorist attack. But the same... And they have said so sure, all day. Sure, but the same leadership who campaigned for Jeremy Corbyn to be Prime Minister a few years ago. Yeah, excuse me. You may have noticed there is a new leader of the Labour Party now, Keir Starmer. Yeah, the guy the, who campaigned for yeah, Corbyn to PPM. And that is why this week Keir Starmer won a by-election with a swing of 20%. That's why the forecasters <clears throat> are now saying, many of whom you've had on your show, that the Labour Party is looking like it's going to have more than 400 seats at the next election. It's because the public do not trust the government at the moment, and the public do trust Keir Starmer. You may not like it. Your viewers, in some cases, may not wish to hear that. But sometimes you have to tell people the truth. And the truth is that this leadership totally condemns this cowardly, disgusting attack that has killed 600 people. And not only as a former MP, but as a former Secretary of State for Northern Ireland who dealt with terrorism, let me tell you, Keir Starmer will not be soft on terrorism, why wherever Keir, why, that may be. Why didn't Keir Starmer resign from the shadow cabinet when Jeremy Corbyn said that Hamas were his friends? Well, again, we can go over history here. If you really want to go over it's history... Quite, it's there's it's a quite lot a U-turn, Hang it? on a second. Rishi Sunak was happy to line up behind Boris Johnson as Prime Minister year I don't think Boris year. Johnson is comparable to Hamas. No, we're not making any... I mean, he ain't perfect, no, no, but no, let's no, not get no. carried Come away. On, let, let's not get into a stupid place. Nobody has suggested that, so let's not even go down that rabbit hole. What we're saying here, and what your viewers and you need to take note of, I think, Mark, is that the public think that Keir Starmer is their leader in waiting. And you can either choose to recognise that the public are making that very clear, the by-election this week, or you can dismiss the public. And, and reasonably enough, you might want to do so. Well, I will give it to Keir Starmer that, actually, he has condemned these attacks by Hamas in no uncertain terms. But what about those other rather woke commentators, Neil, who live on Twitter? We know who they are. High-profile sports TV presenters, uh, LBC hosts, all the rest of it. 
deafening in their silence in the last 24 hours? I think that's particularly true, but I think the, the most significant words that Sean said was this Labour Party, mm. as in this week's Labour Party. On my Twitter feed, I've got a pinned quote, and it is, do the people of Britain believe that people who make a statement should stick by their opinion? Keir Starmer doesn't. So the truth of the matter is it might well suit Keir Starmer this morning to make his statement, but just like on so many issues, do, can uh, a woman have a penis on 180 degree turns? Can, should there be £20 billion promised for net zero? £20 billion U-turns as he drops that one because it becomes clear that the public doesn't like it. Keir Starmer's a flip-flopper. And <clears throat> what you can't get away from, Sean, and you simply can't get away from it, Keir Starmer was Jeremy Corbyn's deputy. Right? Keir Starmer was his deputy throughout that time of anti-Semitism, through all those dreadful incidents that went on and on and on. And Labour MPs And the quitting. Labour MPs and the left of the party that ran it. A momentum, they kept it going, and Keir Starmer... Did you got, see... No, hang on, hang on, you've well, had your long run... you're speaking on truth, This is... This is, this is okay. I'll bring you back issue. in a second, Sean, I'll give you a right to reply. Right, this, Neil. this is the issue. When Starmer got elected, he stood on a platform that he would continue the, the Jeremy Corbyn position right across the board. That's how he got the backing of the lefties. And, you know, it's very convenient for you now to say that this is a great man of honour and he's saying that um, he will stand for this today. There is no track record of him at all, keeping his word, keeping his position, his dissembler, and all he wants to do is get elected. And you talk about the people of Britain have said they want him to be their Prime Minister. In fact, there's a whole series of polls today that actually showed that what really is going on is that they don't particularly want the Tories anymore. They don't really think that Sunak is the man. There is no ringing endorsement, no ringing endorsement for Keir Starmer as the next Prime Minister of the, this country. And the only ringing endorsement that you got in Scotland at Rutherglen was they all have realised what a load of nonsense the SNP are. OK, That's Sean, really do you want to, to come back on all of that? Well, first of all, one of the Labour MPs who left the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn was Luciana Berger, and I'm don't think you probably, therefore, were paying too much attention to the facts today, Neil, rather than uh, the polemic that you've just shared with everyone. Because Luciana Berger at the Labour Party conference today... Oh, I remember. Well, oh, you know, yes. did, you oh, see, yes. did you see what she said today? Yeah, I'm glad that she's did, back. Yeah, she has I'm confidence. Glad no, 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 she's no, 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 that's no, no, hang on, I'm glad that she doesn't did you have hear? to have no, 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 a police no. escort to go into the Labour Party conference, because that was the state of look, play no, let, under and Jeremy Corbyn. Hang on, no, look, you just... You've just excuse me, excuse me, men, men, you've had, you've had your say, plenty of it. But forgive isn't me, the, I, rea no, no, isn't the real no, no, I'll problem... I'll come back to you, I'll come back I've to you. I've not been allowed... Isn't, you'll get your right to reply. Isn't the, I would love for you to answer this question. Isn't the real problem well, that we're I? asking these questions, that there is a suspicion, and there is a massive suspicion still amongst the Jewish community in our country, that <laughs> Labour are right. not to be trusted on this issue or with anti-Semitism. And that is widespread. And I think we have to really analyse why they've still got this problem. If, as you say, it is so solved, then why are people still so concerned about it? Why is this what we're discussing? Why is this what's being discussed so far? Oh, okay. And, why, now, and Sean, why are the MPs Sean, not I'm coming come out to you? I have, this I have got Stephen McCabe waiting uh, in Liverpool to speak to us, Labour MP, who's going to fly the flag for the cause. But your final thoughts on this before we get the break? Well, it's extremely clear to me, first of all, that Luciana Berger making a speech, which clearly you didn't hear, um, made it very clear today why she's now very happy to be back in the Labour Party, because as somebody who cares passionately about this, she believes and trusts Keir Starmer. And I think at the end of the day, what I will say is this. Why don't we all agree that we'll take a £100 bet with each other to a charity of each other's choice that Keir Starmer wins the next election, because I think the public does trust him, and trying to discredit him by pouring on him attacks which are not based in fact. Well, he has are. set out his position now 
is unequivocally late, okay. in today's a, position. In saying that Hamas is a terrorist organisation. I'll tell you what we're going to that do. That should stand. We're going to come back to this at 10.30 for the papers because strong views and, of course, this show, Mark Dolan tonight, is the home of diverse opinion. What is yours? Mark at GBnews.com. Next up in the big story, as they launch their last party conference before the election, is this Labour's moment? I'll be asking top Labour MP Stephen McCabe. See you in two. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Nightmare commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30 a.m. Who benefits from that? Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show. That's fantastic. If it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London-Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10 a.m. till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel... Now, we'll get to your emails very shortly, Mark, at gbnews.com. But it's time now for the big story. And Labour have kicked off their party conference, hopeful that this time next year they will be in power. But are they ready for government? Let's head straight to Liverpool. And I'm delighted to welcome the Labour MP for Birmingham, Selly Oak, Steve McCabe. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. Um, your leader, Sir Keir Starmer, changes his mind quite a lot, doesn't he? The U-turn on £28 billion a year for a green revolution. Various positions on HS2 and his newfound love for Brexit. Will he struggle to make his mind up if he gets into number 10? <laughs> I think you must have been listening to Rishi Sunak last week. Isn't that what he said? No, look, uh, what Keir does is he sets out what is feasible and what's realistic in the circumstances we face. And he's not going to lie to the British public. He's going to tell them the truth about what Labour can achieve and what we can achieve in the circumstances we inherit. Now, the unions, Steve, will expect big public sector pay rises, won't they, if Labour get in? Uh, they fund the party, the unions. Where will the money come from for these pay rises? 
No, I think that we will be sitting down with the unions. We will be talking realistically about what's possible. People are concerned about wages, yes, but they're also concerned about jobs, about safety in the industries mm. and about how we protect public uh, sector industries in the future. And the way to resolve those issues is to have a, a decent, sensible, realistic dialogue. And that's what we'll do, just as we did when we were last in power. Well, indeed, Steve, and I appreciate your point, but the unions will expect a more generous settlement than the Tories have offered. So how's it going to be paid for? Will it be tax rises or cuts in public spending? Because those are the only two options, aren't they? Well, people will be entitled to more as the economy grows. That is absolutely fair enough. And the better the productivity, the better the growth in the economy, the more people can realistically expect. But look, this is not uh, a situation where we will be against the unions like the present government is. This will be a situation where workers and government are in it together to benefit the country. Now, I've got no doubt, Steve, that a Labour government with a big majority could do good things. They have in the past. However, a slender majority is more likely. Doesn't that place power in the hands of Corbyn supporters like John McDonnell and Richard Bergen? Well, it's a bit early to talk about majorities. I mean, obviously, I'd prefer a good majority. I think most sensible people know that it would be better for the country to have a solid government with a good majority. And certainly, if you look at results in places like Selby or Rutherglen, I, I wouldn't rule it out. But, uh, you know, we've got work to do, and we are very aware of that. Well, indeed, but there are plenty of headbangers on those back benches. Not you, Steve, of course, present company accepted. Uh, but they are on the left of the party, and they will make life hell for Keir Starmer if he's working with a 10 or 20 seat majority, which is very likely. Labour with a small majority will be ungovernable, surely. Well, look, I, I think we've just lived through. Um, a Theresa May's government and the country was certainly ungovernable, ungovernable then. Then we have a, a, a Prime Minister with an 80-seat majority who makes the country ungovernable as well. I, you know, I don't think you should be so worried about what Labour will do. Labour's commitment is simple. We want to return the country to a stable, sensible approach in its politics, and we want to root out the nonsense that we've had to live with for the last few years. Uh, what about my viewers and listeners who are very worried that if Keir Starmer wins the election, they're going to have to pay for an electric car, the plan to extend the, uh, the allowance, the ability to buy petrol and diesel cars is extended to 2035. Sunak uh, has announced that. Well, Starmer's going to go back to 2030 again. How are my listeners going to pay for a new car, an electric car? Well, of course, uh, you were talking earlier about people changing their mind. I think, actually, Rishi Sunak uh, suggested that, and then he's obviously just changed his mind. If we really want to make electric cars the norm, then we're going to have to set a target and we're going to have to go for it. And yes, there will have to be support and assistance for people to help them make the transition. That's always been... More exhausting. borrowing, more but, spending. Uh, you know, uh, but by constantly, putting thing, by constantly putting things off, you don't make them happen. Well, that means you won't be putting off extra bills for my viewers and listeners. But, Steve, can I ask you about an interview that the Prime, uh, that the, I said Prime Minister, Freudian slip there, the leader of the opposition, Keir Starmer, gave this morning <laughs> on Breakfast TV. He said that the Rwanda scheme will be axed even if it's working. Why? No, I think he said it would be axed even if the court said it was legal. Uh, and the reason is because we believe it's a total waste of money. It will not have the effect of deterring people from coming to this country. We know from where it's been tried before that doesn't work. It's the wrong policy and it's a waste of our cash. Uh, do you not want to explore the option given that upwards of a thousand people are entering the country illegally every day? Is it not worth exploring? Why is Labour putting up 
a roadblock. You can't be sure that the Rwanda plan won't be a strong disincentive. Well, I know that when other countries have tried it, what happened was that the people smugglers moved to the airport in, in uh, uh, Rwanda and other African countries. They picked people up as they got off the planes, often before they even arrived at the detention centres, and they put them back on a long, torturous route back to the people who are trying to ferry them across the channel. It, it's not the way to address this. The way to address this is to have processing centres outside the UK and to have urgent action, coordinated action with other countries to deal with the people smugglers. Uh, Steve, uh, listen, I'll throw you a bone for the end of our chat. We can both agree that the country is broke. <laughs> You're very kind. <laughs> right? We can, we can agree, can't we? The country is, is broke, and you would argue after 13 years of Tory misrule. But what is the point of a Labour government if there's no money to spend? Well, uh, the country is broke, and I know who broke it, but uh, look, not everything is about money. Uh, quite frankly, you know, stopping giving backdoor contracts to your friends, making it clear that people who don't play by the rules will not remain in government, and that we're going to observe decent standards and root out corruption, that's about moral values. It's got nothing to do with money. We can change this country. People in this country want change, and Labour are the people ready to do it. Steve, have a great couple of days at conference. Brilliant to have you on the show. Look forward to catching up again in the near future. My thanks to the Labour MP for Birmingham, Selly Oak, Steve McCabe. Your reaction, mark at gbnews.com. Let me know your thoughts in terms of what Steve has had to say. Now, coming up with the pundits, is Peter Mandelson right that Keir Starmer is the new Tony Blair? Plus, in an exclusive Mark Dolan tonight People's Poll, we've been asking, are Labour ready for power? The results are in. I shall reveal all next. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the live desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel... Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30am. Who benefits from that? Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show, that's fantastic. <laughs> if it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomney, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. 
I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Are Labour ready for power? That was the topic of our uh, rather interesting big story discussion with Steve McCabe. Uh, we've also got that question as our Twitter poll. So we, uh, we've been asking you, are Labour ready for power? Is Keir Starmer ready for number 10? Well, the results are in. 80.9% say no, whilst 19% say yes, 19.1 to be pedantic. Uh, Linda says, hi, Mark, I would never vote Labour. I wouldn't believe a word Starmer says. Joan says, Mark, who would want a leader who in front of a camera hums and haws and looks confused over a question about a woman? Imagine having him having to make decisions that are of a serious nature. Uh, and as regards the comments by Steve McCabe, Labour MP, that actually it's the right thing to ban the sale of new petrol and diesel cars in 2030, not 2035. Uh, Jean says, I don't want an electric car. I tow a caravan and horse trailer, and I absolutely love my diesel car. Um, so, look, lots more emails. Uh, just one coming in from T. Horn, who says, Hi, Mark. If Labour win the next election, we are, as a country, all doomed. If you thought the Tories were bad, wait and see what Starmer does to this once great country. Starmer and his people cannot be trusted, I fear, for all of us, if he wins. Look, do feel free to email in support of Sir Keir Starmer, because the polls don't lie. Labour are streets ahead, surely for a reason. Well, reacting to the big stories of the day, tonight's top pundits, Former Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, ex-Labour MP Sean Woodward. Former Brexit Party MEP Annunciata Rees-Mogg. And former Executive Editor of the News of the World, Neil Wallace. New Labour Supremo Peter Mandelson has said Keir Starmer is the closest thing to Tony Blair since the man himself occupied number 10 in what could be the final Labour conference before a general election, most likely will be. Starmer's party has vowed to make this country great again. So is... Peter Mandelson right that Keir Starmer is the next Tony Blair. Who better to ask than Sean Woodward? Well, thank you very much. Actually, he qualified it. He said he's the closest thing to Blair. Yeah. Uh, and he then went on to say he's not the same, but he's the nearest thing. Uh, always important to be particular, as you know. I'm, I'm very keen on that. Um, of course. Look, we had the nightmare of Jeremy Corbyn, and it was a nightmare for many, many reasons incredibly insulting on vast numbers of people, not least the Jewish church, who felt absolutely disenfranchised by Jeremy Corbyn. And I think Keir Starmer's gone a long, long way, clearly more to do for you, and indeed many others as well, to recover that trust, because something... Trust is something you earn. You're not just given trust, you earn it. So that's a very important part of it. But is he Tony Blair? He's the closest thing that we've had. And I certainly feel that we should now put our trust in him to deliver. Is he more left-wing than Tony Blair? I don't know if it's really helpful to talk about left-wing and right-wing, because Tony Blair... It's useful won, for, the, uh, for the electorate, won, 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 a general, won, won a general election, um, first of all, back in 1997, which is a whole generation ago. Some people actually have to be told as adults who Tony Blair was. Um, for now... I think the answer is, I think Keir Starmer is pretty much down the middle. What does he want to do? He wants to come in and he wants to get the cost of living down for people. I don't think that's left-wing or right-wing. I think it's pretty common sense. By giving the public he sector to... pay rises, which will no, cause inflation? he wants to cut waiting lists Borrowing in the more NHS money, so which people will cause get inflation? treated. You might be able to afford private health care. I may be able to. You may be able to afford it. And, and Neil. I can't. But most... People can't. They need the NHS. And having 7.5 million people on waiting lists is obscene. Is it left-wing that you want those people to be treated, not die waiting for cancer for treatments? Sure. For sure. Is it left-wing that you want an ambulance to arrive if somebody has a cardiac arrest? I don't think and so. And are those high waiting lists partly because of the lockdowns that Keir Starmer was so fond of? It's not because of the lockdowns. It's because of the fact that we have run the NHS into the ground, and lockdowns became part of an NHS that, under these Tories, for the last 13 years, has been allowed to crumble. But very importantly, 
Keir's message on this is not, oh, all we need to do is give the NHS more money. As articulated by his Shadow Health Secretary, Wes Streeting, as well, the NHS has got to reform and modernise or it will die. Okay. That's a very strong message. It's not a left-wing message. It's not a right-wing message. It's a sensible, down-the-line, middle-of-the-road message to get people treated. Well, Annunciata, I think my viewers and listeners would like to know whether Keir Starmer is more left-wing than Tony Blair, because Tony Blair... Uh, made sure that the top rate of tax stayed at 40%, and I would argue that New Labour were quite aspirational compared to the current shadow cabinet. Uh, uh, New Labour um, wanted to make sure that they didn't fail on the economy, as every other Labour government has historically always done. And they therefore followed the Conservative spending plans, and that was a very sensible move. Was it ideological or was it to win? Sean just asked, uh, what is it that Sir Keir wants? Well, the answer is to win. And as far as I can tell, he will say whatever he thinks will go down well or as little as possible to not annoy anyone. And I don't think any of us know what he stands for. Is it left or right? Who knows? Did he back Jeremy Corbyn? Yes. Does he seem to be getting on very well with the Blairites? Yes. Do we have any idea who he is? No, not really. Why is that a problem? Hey, I think... A strong leader, uh, someone who will forge a future for our country, a, a great and prosperous future that we deserve, to run our services in an effective way so that we all get value for money as taxpayers and the services we expect and need. You have got to have a leader, and that leader's got to have a backbone and they've got to have a character, and I don't think we've seen either. How do Blair and Starmer compare in your view, Neil? I think you were at The Sun newspaper during the Blair years. Uh, I was the deputy editor of The Sun um, when The Sun... Uh, you remember it made huge headlines in itself, uh, turned from supporting the Tory government of the time to backing wholeheartedly uh, Tony Blair. And I had a huge amount to deal with him. I had a huge amount to deal with that new Labour government. Mm. And uh, one of the instant things that come to mind for me about whether or not they're similar is they're completely dissimilar because Blair believed in things. Blair believed in aspiration, he believed in his policies, he drove them forward, whereas, of course, Starmer just believes in whatever he thinks today will get him more support. There's a great, useful poll today in the mail. Get your and poll this out. Is, this is um, what the public think about Keir Starmer. Does he represent real change or represent more of the same? Real change, 35%. More of the same, 47%. Sticks to his decisions, 37%. Changes his mind and flips, flops, 42 Has a strong vision for the UK's future, 35 Has no real vision for the UK's future, 43 Can be trusted to tell the truth, 38 Can't be trusted to tell the truth, 42 Is a strong leader, 38 Is a weak leader. 43. Now, what this tells Damning. you is the truth of the Conservative parties are doing their level best to lose this election. Mm. But there is no stampede towards Keir Starmer as a leader. And what you have to remember, at the time when Blair got elected, there was a stampede towards him. This is a stampede away from the Tory party. The difference could not be greater between... Uh, Blair and Starmer. And you know what? Mandelson knows it, but Mandelson is a spin doctor and Mandelson is simply trying to ingratiate himself back with the uh, Labour leadership. Only a couple of seconds. Yes or no? Could the Starmer factor lose Labour the next election? I think it is possible the less that he actually shows he believes in anything... Mm. This is the issue. Does okay. he believe in anything? Answer, no. OK, well, your thoughts on this, Mark, at gbnews.com. We'll return to this topic when the papers come in at 10.30. But coming up in my take at 10, Rishi Sunak's ban on smoking is the nanny state in overdrive. It's illiberal, it won't work, and it's a waste of police time. Stick that in your pipe and smoke it. But first, my Mark Meets guest is the former Conservative MP and best-selling chick lit author Louise Mensch, who's been described as an unhinged British witch by Vladimir Putin. She's next.
Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30am. Who benefits from that? Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show, that's fantastic. If it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? <laughs> oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomney, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Nightmare commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6pm, Monday to Friday on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows, Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel... Uh, well, just one email. Mark says, Joanne, Keir Starmer wanted us to vote for Jeremy Corbyn as a PM a couple of years ago. How could anyone trust him? OK, folks, it's time for this. It's time for Mark Meets. And one of those rare people that's had multiple successful careers. Louise Mensch, formerly Louise Bagshaw, came to public attention in the 90s as the author of 15 smash hit best-selling novels, rather dismissively referred to as chicklets, but which entertained millions of readers around the world. Following quite the career change, she went on to become the Conservative MP for Corby at the 20 gen 2010 general election. Following her stint... In Westminster, she moved to the US and launched the news and opinion website Heat Street, among other ventures. And whether it's her views on Donald Trump or Vladimir Putin or British or American politics, Louise Mensch is one of the most fearless and compelling commentators out there. And I'm delighted to say she joins me now. Louise, welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. You left the UK just under 10 years ago, and I know you miss us terribly, uh, but you've got a bit of perspective now. What's your view of the current state of the country? Well, look, you can take the girl out of Britain, but you can't take Britain out of the girl. I think it's a bit worrying, frankly, what's going on in the UK. As a lifelong Conservative, I think it's inevitable that the Tories are going to lose the next election, and that is something that worries me. Even if it's for one cycle, I don't want to see the country given into the hands of the Labour Party, but I'm afraid that's what's going to happen. Mm. Um, and it just feels like the government has run out of ideas. This does happen sometimes when there's a one-party government for a very long time, uh, but it's, it's regrettable. 
Indeed. Uh, if they are eviscerated at the next election, uh, what does the Conservative Party 2.0 look like? Because they'll be out of power for five years. What direction should they take, do you think, if they lose? I think they have to decide that they're going to put an end to the circular firing squad. If they lose, me and millions of people like me are going to put it down to the defenestration of Boris Johnson without asking the voters. Nobody asked for Liz Truss, nobody wanted that, and still fewer people wanted Rishi Sunak, where even the Conservative Party membership did not get a chance to vote for him. I was a supporter of Penny Mordaunt throughout the um, leadership elections that I didn't think should be happening any anyway. And the Conservative Party never got a chance to vote for her. She is somebody I think that the nation could have voted for. But Rishi Sunak, you know, the multi-millionaire, out of touch guy, I just, I just, I really don't think he's done a very good job. He was a media darling, but that just isn't translating into poll results, into by-election results. Um, and as a result, I think we are frankly going to lose. And we threw away an election winner for two successive election losers, and there's a price to be paid for that. So by the sounds of it, you think that Boris Johnson, based upon democratic principles, should still be the PM. Do you think if Boris were in number 10, he could win in a year's time? Um, I oh, See, now that's a very good question. I don't know. Probably not is the answer, but I think that he would minimise the defeat. And that may sound like very small beer, but actually... Climbing back, as we, as we Tories found out after the 1997 wipeout, climbing back from a wipeout takes a lot longer than uh, climbing back after a, a, a less of a defeat, mm. if you like, when there's mm. not such a big mountain to overcome. And a huge... Uh, there's, the other thing, of course, is that the other party that's in power, if they have an enormous majority, they can do whatever they want. Mm. They can govern, they can push their agenda forward and so forth. If you manage to control that defeat... It's not as bad as it might be. So I don't know about democratic principles either. In our constitution, it's the members of parliament that pick the prime minister, but equally there's consequences for that. And the idea that they would just chuck a leader out, then chuck another leader out and can't make up their minds, that's dithering. And conservatives are not supposed to be ditherers. And why do you worry about five years of Labour? Because, although I think Keir Starmer is very uninspiring, middle of the road, he's relatively sensible, but unfortunately, he's not the only person in the Labour top ranks, is he? You know, mm. this, is, this is a party that has embraced Jeremy Corbyn. It's a party that's embraced Diane Abbott. It's a party that's embraced extremists of all stripes. We've had uh, ridiculous statements from people at the very top of the party, and I don't see any clear policy agenda. Your last guest, I thought, was really compelling when he made the excellent point very well that people don't love Keir Starmer at all. They really don't. But the one number that wasn't in the polls that he read out is better than the Tories, percent X, Y. Although Keir Starmer was failing on everything else, I fear that if there was a poll better than the Tories, he would have come out on top of that one. And that's really on my party. It's not on the Labour Party. It's on us. We're losing the election. Now, you're based in the US. You've had harsh words for Donald Trump over the years. Do you think he'll be the next incumbent in the White House? I absolutely do not. I think there's no chance whatsoever that independents, who at the end of the day are the ones that swing elections, just like in, uh, in Great Britain, it's those marginal constituencies that count. Um, in America as well, it's marginal districts in marginal states that count for the electoral college. Are those independents, those persuadable voters going to vote for Donald Trump? I very much doubt it. But that said, I very much doubted it in 2016 as well, and I was proven wrong. The terrifying fact for people like me is that it's going to be a two-horse race, and in a two-horse race, the other guy can always win. Mm. There is always a possibility. You know, if the possibility is 75% likelihood of Joe Biden winning, that still leaves one in four chances of Donald Trump winning. So I am very worried about it, and I think everybody sensible should be worried about it.
Uh, now, you've been quite vocal in the last 24 hours, understandably, about the shocking and devastating attack on Israel. Innocent civilians murdered, dragged out of their homes uh, uh, first thing in the morning. Of course, uh, these are terrorists. This is Hamas. Uh, what's your reaction to how the media have reported this story, particularly the likes of the BBC? Yeah, the BBC's reporting has been incredibly disappointing. I actually, in preparation for this interview, I went back and looked at the BBC's live blog from the very beginning. And almost at the very start, they had people like Jeremy Bowen, who has been criticised in the past for his pro-Palestinian chances, both sizing this issue, saying, for example, and this, was, this is a literal quotation, that there have been escalating violence in the last few months between Palestinians and Israelis. Oh, please. This was Hamas. It was a terrorist attack. They are kidnapping old people. They are raping women and parading their naked corpses around the streets. They are kidnapping little tiny children and taking them away. This isn't war. This is terrorism. And for the BBC to fail in the way that it's reported this, to give uh, equal airtime, if you like, to Palestinians who are excusing this and celebrating this, that's disgraceful. It goes against the BBC's charter, and I really hope that Carolyn Dinage and my successors on the Culture, Media and Sport Committee will take a look at the BBC's endemic bias against Israel because it's got to stop. If not now, then when? Of course, the BBC would challenge that and would argue they've tried to cover this horrific set of events as uh, impartially as they can, but it's all about opinions. Uh, Louise, I've only got a couple of seconds. I'm urging my viewers and listeners to follow you on Twitter, at Louise Mensch. Uh, briefly, if you can, what's next for you? Oh, I don't know. I think I'll just carry on being a commentator. I invest in real estate here in America, and I hope to come over and make a difference as best as I can during the next general election. Well, I look forward to that. Come, come and see us in the studio, Louise. It's been a fascinating conversation. My thanks to Louise Mensch. Coming up in the 10 o'clock hour, I'll be dealing with Rishi Sunak and his ridiculous ban on smoking. Time to stub it out. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Nightmare commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB+, Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is, Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30am. Who benefits from that? Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show, that's fantastic. If it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament, but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10 a.m. till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience.
Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel... Plenty of fireworks to come. It is 10 o'clock on television, on radio and online in the United Kingdom and across the world. This is Mark Dolan tonight. In my take of 10, Rishi Sunak's ban on smoking is the nanny state in overdrive. It's illiberal. It won't work and it's a waste of police time. Stick that in your pipe and smoke it. As they also had their conference this weekend, could Reform UK become the main party of the right if the Tories collapse at the next election? I'll be asking tonight's newsmaker, politics legend and member of Reform UK, a woman who wowed her conference audience yesterday, the one and only Anne Widdicombe. Plus tomorrow's newspaper front pages and live reaction in the studio from tonight's top pundits. So, a packed show, lots to get through, but first the news and Ray Addison. Thanks, Mark, and good evening to you. Our top story, the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, says the UK is ready to provide any support that Israel needs after it was attacked by the terrorist organisation Hamas. Those watching on TV can see live footage of Gaza's night skyline now. Israel says 800 Hamas targets have been hit over the last two days, killing hundreds of fighters with dozens more captured. Earlier, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said they will turn anywhere Hamas terrorists are hiding into, quote, an island of ruins. He also urged the people of Gaza to leave those areas now. More than 700 Israelis were killed and more than 1,500 injured in yesterday's surprise attack. Nathaniel Young, a 20-year-old British man serving in the Israeli army, was also killed and at least 400 Palestinians have died. The scenes that we've seen in Israel over the past 36 hours are truly horrifying. I want to express my absolute solidarity for the people of Israel. Now is not a time for equivocation, and I'm unequivocal. Hamas and the people who support Hamas are fully responsible for this appalling act of terror, for the murder of civilians and for the kidnapping of innocent people, including children. I've just spoken with Prime Minister Netanyahu to assure him of the UK's steadfast support. Well, Lieutenant Colonel Richard Hecht is the IDF's international spokesperson. He described the scene on the ground earlier. The visuals are uh, ISO visuals. In a way, this is our 9-11. This is our 9-11. And, you know, even more than that, I mean, it wasn't crashing into a building. It's uh, also mutilating and attacking a party that was happening around the, the Gaza Strip. A nature party, uh, attacking civilians, kidnapping a grandmother. Well, number 10 has projected the Israeli flag onto Downing Street. Sharing the image on X, the Prime Minister said it showed solidarity with the people of Israel. It comes after the flag was flashed onto several public locations in the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv. The flag has also been shared on public buildings in cities around the world, including Berlin and New York. Well, GB News understands that Labour plans to appoint a Covid corruption commissioner if the party wins the next general election. The new role is designed to help recoup billions of pounds of taxpayers' money lost during the pandemic. Labour believes there were cases of waste, fraud and flawed contracts. Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves is expected to make the announcement. This is GB News across the UK on TV, in your car, on digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying, play GB News. Now let's get back to Mark. My thanks to Ray Addison, who returns in an hour's time. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. As they also had their conference this weekend, could Reform UK become the main party of the right if the Conservatives collapse at the next election? I'll be asking tonight's newsmaker, politics legend and member of Reform UK, a woman who wowed her conference audience yesterday, Anne Widdicombe. Plus, tomorrow's newspaper front pages and live reaction in the studio from tonight's top pundits. This evening, former Labour MP Sean Woodward, ex-Brexit Party MEP Annunciata Rees-Mogg and Fleet Street legend Neil Wallace. 
They'll be nominating their headline heroes and back page zeros of the day. A packed hour, and those papers are coming. But cut the music if you wouldn't mind. Before we start, very exciting news, folks. Comedy legend John Cleese's brand new show on GB News launches on October the 29th. Isn't that fantastic? Now, John and I have had our differences online in recent weeks, but I'm confident the new show will be brilliant and his first hit in 35 years. Let's start with my take at 10. Not satisfied with deciding our movement, movements over two and a half years, pressurising a certain medication on the whole population, stopping people going out to work for what we were told was a health crisis, the spirit of authoritarianism and government overreach continues apace as the pandemic becomes a distant memory. The instruments of state control are now in place. Which is why I was hugely disappointed with the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's announcement that he'll ban smoking among younger people with an ambition to have tobacco completely eradicated within a generation. First of all, good luck with that. The minute that you outlaw something, you create an instant black market for the banned substance, and you make it more attractive to the young population you're seeking to protect. Secondly, smoking is in decline anyway, and perhaps more rigorous rules, though not a ban, would be more appropriate for vaping, which is marketed at kids by unscrupulous tobacco companies seeking a new market. Bubblegum flavour, lemonade flavour, rhubarb, with bright packaging, these are highly alluring products to young people. But having overplayed its hand over the last few years, resulting in health policies that have destroyed our economy, created a poorer, angrier and more divided society, and with policies that created a generation of damaged kids and an NHS waiting list of almost 8 million people, it's time for the state to back off a bit and stay out of our lives. Rishi Sunak betrays his conservative credentials with a nanny state policy like this, and the problem is that if you yield to this government-sponsored micromanaging of our lives, where does it end? I mean, lots of things aren't good for you. Alcohol, fast food, supporting Tottenham Hotspur. Rishi Sunak's proposed ban on smoking is illiberal, illogical and unenforceable. Do you really think the police have enough time to run around checking whether someone is old enough to be smoking a packet of Lambert and Butler or Marlboro Lights if they can't stop mugging knife crime, burglary and sexual assault. I wouldn't hold my breath in their ability to stop us having a puff. This is the sort of policy that you'd expect from the Labour Party. In fact, it's exactly their kind of policy, hinted at by the Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting just a few months ago. And here was my reaction, in my big opinion, at the time. Those people that if you tell me I can't do something, that's exactly the thing that I'm going to do. I think many of you are the same. Which is why, even though I'm an avowed non-smoker, if Labour win and they try to ban smoking, I will see that as a test case for freedom. And I pledge to take up this filthy habit just to annoy them. Arrest me, why don't you? In fact, why don't I give it a go right now? Just to get some, you know, practice uh, under my belt. What do you think? How does this work? Mark my words, under a Labour government, our freedoms will go up in smoke. Now, rest assured, like Bill Clinton, I didn't inhale. I would advise people against smoking, drinking too much and eating unhealthily, of course. But I would encourage the government to do that and start that conversation through education, not diktat and state tyranny. It is a fundamental human right to do things which are bad for you. You should never break the law, but being naughty is what makes life worth living. Rishi Sunak's proposed ban on smoking is the nanny state in overdrive, and it's time to stub it out. <sighs> what do you think? Mark at GBnews.com. Not happy with this policy at all. Let's get reaction from my top pundits, former Labour MP Sean Woodward, ex-Brexit Party MEP Annunciata Rees-Mogg, and Fleet Street legend Neil Wallace. Neil, uh, what do you think about this? It doesn't sound like a very conservative policy to me. I've never smoked in my life. <clears throat> I loathe it. <clears throat> I loathe the smell of it. And, of course, they shouldn't ban it. As you quite rightly said, you just look at 
prohibition going back to the 1920s. You ban anything that is in any way alluring to young people, and you know what? They'll go after it. Of course they will. Annunciata, the police don't have time to enforce this. It's almost worse than that, that if you have laws that people don't respect, uh, the law is pointless. Mm. And I can't believe anyone is going to respect the difference. I mean, you could have twins who were born either side of midnight and one could smoke for the rest of their lives, they might live to 100, and the other would never legally buy a packet of cigarettes. It's nonsense. We need laws that are workable. I, I don't agree with this one as it happens in the first place. But if we are going to have ridiculous, draconian, nanny state laws, at least make them ones that can function within our society. Indeed, Sean, the Prime Minister's keynote speech was very important at conference this week on Wednesday. That was his last conference before the election. I'm amazed that he used up so much political capital on this one policy. Well, when I was Secretary of State in Northern Ireland, I had the previous year brought in the first smoking ban in the UK. And I have to say, as somebody who was a smoker and was a smoker at the time, um, I'm really proud of having brought in that legislation. It led to the ban being introduced in public places for smoking all over the UK. I think what's really important here is to first of all recognise that currently, of those deaths over the age of 35 in England, one five, 15% of those are attributable to cancer for smoking. And it's also important to note that it costs us, and I'm glad we do it, of course, to help people who've got cancer caused by smoking, it costs £10,000 a year to treat them. The idea that it's just a free thing, you can go around smoking, nobody gets hurt, is crazy. Mm. I was, I think, a victim of my own stupidity in smoking. I'm glad I finally was able to give it up. And I gave it up because my kids pressurised me into doing it as young adults. They just said, Dad, we don't want you to die early. That, for me, was the thing that changed everything. But I do feel that we have a responsibility in public life of setting an example on something like this. And when you know it costs £10,000 a year to treat people who are dying unnecessary deaths and experiencing unnecessary cancer, not all lung cancer is caused by smoking, of course, but a very large amount of it is caused by smoking. And one of my closest friends, my first boss in television, Esther Ranson, has stage four lung cancer. Was it because in her youth she was a smoker? She doesn't know. She gave it up 40 years ago. But I look at Esther as somebody who taught me everything about journalism. It's one of the greatest journalists and women in television, busting every glass ceiling, creating child line, okay. creating the silver line. And she's, she's dying because of lung cancer. Well, yes, If I we mean... can save one life, let's save it. If we can save lots of lives, Let's use legislation to do it. And Sean is right, isn't he, Annunciata? But you could do that with anything that's bad for you. I mean, the government could ban alcohol. It could ban coffee or custard cream biscuits. Where does it end? Food, generally. Uh, if you eat too much of it, it kills you. Um, so, in fact, maybe we should all starve. I don't know. I think it's... Uh, it, when you make the law an ass, it's not respected and it doesn't work. It makes a mockery of it. It creates a huge black market. The rates of smoking amongst the under-18s are minute now anyway. It's hugely unfashionable. Being untrendy will kill smoking, not making it illegal, which gives it a, a romance to a certain section of people uh, that gives it a greater appeal. Do you think we were wrong, Annunciata, to ban smoking in public places then? Yes. Even though it's led to a decline in the <clears throat> number of people smoking? I, I don't think that it, it, it's necessarily a direct line. I think the pressure and the direction of travel of the fashion was that smoking was dropping off a cliff anyway. And, do you think and people were watching their parents and grandparents get cancer, die of cancer. There were some very famous cases uh, of lung cancer sufferers very widely advertised in the 1990s. It was already dropping and briefly, before it happened. And it will be fashion that kills it entirely. Br briefly, I think also, just to resolve this, this dispute between Annunciata and Sean, I would say, Neil, that actually there's a difference between banning smoking in certain public places, because if you're in a cafe, you don't have any control about whether there's smoke or not if someone lights up. So I'd actually sort of support what Sean did in Northern Ireland, but stopping people consuming a product altogether crosses a line. Yes, I think they're very different things, aren't they? 
Um, stopping someone smoking in a public place where it annoys me, a non-smoker, is one thing. Being able to do it elsewhere in your own private life, mm. I think, becomes something very different. And, of course, Sean will know that a far bigger problem is obesity, diabetes. Uh, these are the plagues of the modern era. Uh, smoking is already collapsing. Uh, the figures are already collapsing anyway. I agree with Sean. One is too many. I completely agree. I know Esther. I mean, I, I think it's a tragedy. But there are now other pressing issues. Indeed. Well, look, uh, thank you so much for that debate. And thanks for mentioning Esther Branson, who is one of my broadcasting heroes. And uh, she's been on the show a couple of times. We do wish her well in her battle against lung cancer. Uh, coming up, they also had their conference this weekend. Could Reform UK become the main party of the right if the Tories collapse at the next election? I'll be asking tonight's newsmaker, politics legend and member of Reform UK, a woman who wowed her conference audience yesterday, Anne Widdicombe. You must see Anne in action. We've got the video. All of that is next, plus tomorrow's papers. See you in two. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate, both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel... Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30am. Who benefits from that? Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show, that's fantastic. <laughs> if it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Let me tell you, you're not happy about Rishi Sunak's proposed ban on smoking for people born after a certain year. Uh, this from Terry, who says, Mark, this is my first time watching your show. Great opening sequence. Thank you, Terry. Uh, Terry says, police will want to enforce the smoking ban as it's a way of doing a search of young adults when caught smoking. Another reason will be the fines that can be issued, another stealth tax. Declan says, alcohol kills more people than smoking. Clive says, hi, Mark, I smoke 40 a day and this government and any government can bend down and kiss my ass. 
Strong words there from Clive, not pulling his punches. Utterly ridiculous, says Peter. Totally draconian. We are adults and need to be treated as such. Huge government overreach. I would only push it into illegal supply. Time to draw a line in the sand and say no. I'll get to more of your emails shortly. But this weekend saw the annual conference of Reform UK, led by Richard Tice, and a party that hopes to steal the clothes of the Conservatives, particularly if they collapse at the next election. Well... The jewel in the crown of this new movement is unquestionably a good friend of mine, former government minister and broadcaster Anne Widdicombe, who wowed the crowd at yesterday's event. I meant, have you had enough of yes. this government? Yes. Have you had enough of a load of talk and no action? Yes. Have you had enough of an opposition which changes its mind every two seconds? Yes and sends us all dizzy with U-turns. <laughs> now, if you really have had enough, if you really want change, then there is only one way of going about that, and that is to reject comprehensively what we have now. Yeah. A masterclass in oratory, and I'm delighted to say that Anne Widdicombe joins me now and congratulations on your fantastic speech. It reminds us what we're missing, not having you in public life. But, of course, my many viewers love watching you every Sunday night. Can Reform UK replace the Conservatives as the party of the right in the long term? And if the Tories collapse, which they may in a year's time? Yes, I think it can, because we stand for common sense. Um, we are uh, interested uh, not in banning smoking. Uh, but in banning illegal immigration, uh, I think our priorities are widely shared uh, amongst the population. Uh, and so, yes, I think we can replace the Tories. And the only thing that would stop us would be if the Tories became Tories. But I don't see any sign of that. No. And uh, how did the speech go down yesterday? I mean, I could hear the applause. Tell me about the experience this weekend uh, as, you, as you took your part in, in this uh, annual conference of Reform UK. Well, it's, it was a tremendous conference, let me say that. The hall was absolutely packed. Uh, we had over a, a thousand people, uh, and when you think this is a small party, uh, and the energy was huge, nothing like you know, the vibes that were coming over from the Tory conference, and as for the Lib Dems, I've forgotten even what their conference was like. Uh, this was a very, very memorable conference. And, of course, you know, once upon a time, I used to speak at Conservative Party conference uh, and then at the Brexit Party rallies, but uh, this was something else again. Can you now rule out ever becoming a member of the Conservatives? Well, I think they've ruled it out for me because, as I've just said, they're not Conservatives. And the only way I'm ever going to rejoin uh, the Conservatives would be if that is what they once more became, if they believed in low taxation, if they didn't interfere in people's lives if they had priorities which are reflected amongst the general population. All the things the Conservatives used to be and used to do, uh, and which they've just lost complete sight of and absolutely lost sight of it. Uh, do you think in the long term, given the nature of our electoral system, the best option, Anne, to have a truly Conservative government is a Conservative coalition between the Tories and UKIP and Reform UK? I don't necessarily think that is the answer, although I would like to think that if uh, we held the balance of power after the next election, uh, that uh, we would manage to turn the Tories back into Tories. But there would be absolutely no guarantee of it. They might go off and, mm. and link up with the Lib Dems. You, you, you just don't know. Uh, so I, you know, I don't think, I mean, you brought UKIP in there. As far as I'm concerned, the major opposition at the moment to the major parties comes from the Reform UK. We're the only ones that are growing. And, Anne, you are a realist as well as an optimist. What do you think success looks like for Reform UK at the next election? Well, I think success looks like winning seats uh, in Parliament. I think success looks like putting sufficient pressure on the Tories that they change course. I don't see any sign of that at all at the moment. And I think success would come from uh, actually making the most of Brexit, which uh, the current government, and certainly Keir Starmer's, uh, aspiring government, um, neither of them are interested in doing that. 
Indeed. Now, Anne, let me ask you what you think of the leader of the opposition, Keir Starmer, saying that even if the Rwanda plan works, he will axe it. What does that tell us about Labour's attitude to border control? It tells us what we already know, which is that they are not interested in border control. They're not interested uh, in effectively patrolling our borders. Uh, they're only interested in political correctness. And to them, Rwanda is politically incorrect. Uh, so therefore, they're going to abandon it, even if it works. So even if, uh, for example, we had um, the first plane loads going to Rwanda in the new year, let's say it was as close as that, and that gradually over next year, you know, the numbers built up and then the numbers coming in fell because it was a huge deterrent and people didn't want to go to Rwanda. Even if all that happens, Keir Starmer is promising the illegal immigrants, it's OK, don't worry, we'll scrap that and you'll just be able to come in as usual. The man is quite mad. Now, Anne, I know that you want neither a Conservative or a Labour government, but do you think a victory for Keir Starmer in a year's time would be a cleansing moment for our democracy, given that this government seems to have run out of steam? No, I don't think it would be cleansing at all. I think it would be a disaster. Uh, I think that uh, what Keir Starmer offers, for example, is, is greater closeness to Europe. It's um, equally high taxation, if not higher than we've got at the moment. It's much less determination to control the borders. Uh, I think everything uh, Keir offers. Mark you, when he does offer something, it, you know, five minutes later, he's changed his mind. So you're not quite certain what his, what his programme is. Uh, but so far, what he's offered um, does not attract me. Uh, and the only thing that is going to put it right is either if we have a reform government or the Conservatives rediscover their conservatism. And as I say, no sign of that, whatever. This is a party with an 80 majority, and it couldn't have made a bigger hash of being in government if it had actually set out to do so. And a fabulous speech at Reform UK conference yesterday, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in a week's time, the remarkable Anne Widdicombe. Uh, coming up, my pundits will be nominating their headline heroes and back page zeros of the day, plus tomorrow's papers and an exclusive Mark Dolan tonight People's Poll has been conducted. We've been asking, could Reform UK become the main party of the right if the Tories collapse at the next election? Well, the results are in. I will reveal all next. Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30am. Who benefits from that? Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show, that's fantastic. If it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? In your mouth. OK. Here comes a, here comes a train. <laughs> Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Nightmare commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's at drive time, 3 till 6pm, Monday to Friday on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. 
From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel... An interesting email from Peter in Manchester. Good evening, Peter. How are you? Mark at gbnews.com is the email address. Why don't you have one of your famous polls and ask your viewers if there were an election tomorrow, who would you vote for? I'll start you off. I'll be voting reform. Well, Peter, thank you for that. That's a great idea. We'll do that next weekend. Uh, but for now, I have been conducting one of my famous polls, and this one is a simple one. Could Reform UK become the main party of the right if the Tories collapse at the next election? The results are in. 61.7% say yes, whilst 38.3% say no. Well, it's 10.30, so it's time now for this. Yes, tomorrow's papers. Uh, thank you, James. So we've got the Daily Telegraph here. US sends warships and jets to help Israel. Uh, German festival goers body paraded around Gaza. Shani Luke, who I spoke about earlier in my big opinion, the tattoo artist has been identified as the woman whose naked body was paraded through the streets of Gaza by Hamas terrorists. Speaking of which, in an opinion piece in The Telegraph, the former director of BBC television, Danny Cohen, says the BBC fails the public by not calling Hamas what they are, terrorists. Also, Keir Starmer to act Rwanda plan, even if it works. And AFD support surges in Germany's elections. The uh, right-wing AFD party... Uh, was tonight on course to become the country's second largest party in key regional elections that spells disaster for Olaf Scholz's ruling coalition. Independent Israel urges Britain stand with us against the evil terror of Hamas. Also, Labour in Liverpool, Rachel Reeves vows to cut energy bills to get Britain building again. The Guardian, violence escalates as death toll surges to over a thousand. Metro, merciless, a new level of horror as Middle East erupts. 600 Israelis killed and 100 taken hostage, boasts Hamas. And some much-needed light relief, Daily Star. We will say this only once. Allo, allo, le bedbugs. Join the resistance as UK hotels quiz guests and Air France will ground flights. Don't be a big booby. Resist mutant French bedbugs, say the star. A UK hotel chain is even quizzing guests if they've arrived from France. There you go. The bedbugs, the new Covid. Who knew? Uh, let's get reaction now to those headlines from my top pundits. Former Labour MP Sean Woodward, ex-Brexit Party MEP, Annunciata Rees-Mogg, and Fleet Street legend, former editor of a national red-top newspaper, Neil Wallace. OK, lots of stories to get through. Uh, it obviously dominated by Israel. And really, there's just no vocabulary available to us, is there, Neil, to describe the horror <clears throat> uh, of, of what's playing out in the Middle East and, and uh, this, this uh, awful onslaught on innocent civilians? Um, as we're sitting here, uh, I got a tweet um, saying that at this festival site... Mm. They have just that uh, Hamas attacked. It was a peace festival, incidentally. This festival, yeah. they've discovered two hundred and fifty bodies. I mean, how much more can you say about the the utter horror of this? And it goes back to what you touched on so much earlier. Where is the outcry from the left? Where is the outcry from Gary Lineker? Where is the outcry from those great worthy pundits constantly telling us what we can and shouldn't care about? Mm. And similarly, I think an important story that I was going to raise anyway... Yeah. BBC fails pundit public by not calling Hamas what they are, terrorists. Well, 
The BBC are saying these are militants. They are calling them fighters. By our own governments, uh, by our own parliaments, definition, they are terrorists, these people. And yet our national broadcaster will not call them what they are. They have to sugarcoat the, who they are. And they have they've, to talked about, they've talked about conflict on both sides. Well, yes. it wasn't conflict on both sides 24 hours ago, was no, it? At, at 7 a.m. yesterday morning mm. in, uh, in Israel, there was no conflict then. And then 2,200 rockets were fired by Hamas. Mm. Then they flew in terrorists on motorbikes with machine guns. They smashed down security fences to go and massacre young people and kidnap old people. They paraded through the streets of Gaza, old people they have kidnapped. Yeah. It's, it's simply unbelievable. Indeed, and it's a tragedy for the people of Israel and a major headache for the free world. Uh, this is the only democracy in the region, uh, Annunciata, and here we are in the Telegraph. US sends warships and jets to help Israel. As, as they should, uh, and I'm glad that the world, <laughs> the Western world, the democratic world, mm. does appear to be standing uh, in utter solidarity with Israel for these uh, horrific terrorist actions. But it is, without doubt, a, a real concern for all the rest of the world that it, there are a lot of assumptions, I, I think, as yet not direct proof that this is supported by Iran and it is using Palestinians as a sort of puppet state to its own ends. And mm. where this ends, we don't know but it's deeply worrying. We are in a dark place. Well, moving on, Labour's deputy leader, Angela Rayner, has promised the biggest increase in affordable housing in a generation if they win the next election. Never one to mince her words. She also said the party would get tough with developers who try to wriggle out of their social obligations. So will Labour solve the housing crisis? Sean? Well, I think... You couldn't do much worse than this government. We actually managed last year to have a 12% fall in creating affordable housing in the UK. There's a relatively modest target of 300,000 homes to be built every year, new homes. The government's failed on that. And Michael Gove, given money to actually build houses, make houses happen, hands it back to the Treasury because he's unable to spend it. Now, I know that you can have problems with civil servants who may not want you to do what they want, and they do what they want. Having said that, my experience of civil servants is they were actually extremely good at Northern Ireland. So this is about direction, mm -hmm. uh, and it's about having, for example, a vision of what you want. So I think what Angela said, to be precise, always precise on these things, what she said was the biggest boost to housing. And we're not going to solve the housing crisis in one Labour term in government, but we can make a boost. We can do more affordable housing. And I think things, for example, like removing the cap that currently sits on councils, whereby they're only allowed to spend 10% of their grant on buying housing stock to make it available to people, I think changing that, very sensible. I think the example that Keir Starmer gave today about planning laws, completely absurd that it takes two years to build a wind farm, but in practice it's 11 years because of all the things you've got to get through. The fact that actually we have all of this land in the UK, very little land actually in the UK is built on, most land is rural, most land is agricultural. About 11% urban tops? Yeah, 11%, hmm. that means nearly 90% is rural. If we need a bit more in order for people to have houses, is that really such a terrible thing? I don't think so. Um, I would like to see people with their own homes. It was a noble ambition by um, governments at the end of the Second World War, homes fit for heroes. There are many heroes out there. There are many people who need them, and they don't have them. And, and we should answer? do something. Yeah, are, are, you, are you convinced by Labour's plan? Um, no, uh, in a short answer, um, that part of the plan is to introduce a new tax to raise money to make sure there's lots of social and affordable housing. But um, this rather reminds me of we tax cigarettes because we don't want people to smoke. We tax sugar because we don't want people to eat too much sugar. 
and if you tax housing, developers won't build enough houses. There are already immense costs. The 11 years that Sean has just cited, that is all a huge cost to a developer. That puts up the cost of the energy at the end of it. It is the same for the homes. If you have to jump through thousands of legal hoops in order to build a new development, then the cost is passed on to the people who end up in those homes, either in the form of higher price to purchase or in higher rent. And what we need to do is make it easier to build, cheaper to build good quality, not keep adding to the burden so that people are priced out even further. And Annunciata, is the elephant in the room not levels of legal net migration? Because what is the point in building more houses if upwards of a million people come to the country it, every year through legal routes? I mean, net migration last year, 600,000. You can build as many houses as you, li as you like. It won't touch, touch the sides. I, I think it was noticeable that that was not mentioned at the Conservative Party conference, and I regret that. It really is the elephant in the room for the Conservatives, because no matter how much you build, you're not going to keep up. We're way behind the targets with no migration, let alone if you're going to add in hundreds of thousands every single year, more than a million in the last two years. And it, on top of that, you've got our uh, NHS, you've got the schools, which are all creaking at the seams with too much demand. Unless you can build up all of those, you just can't take the people. Well, do don't, don't you think we focus a lot, don't we, Neil, on the illegal crossings and they are a humanitarian, economic and national security disaster. But it's the elephant in the room, the legal net migration, 600,000 last year. This discussion about new houses is a complete red herring. Um, I don't think it's a complete red herring because it's got to be addressed. But your basic point is completely correct. Um, 600,000, let's just make that... We'll divide, turn it into families. Say 150,000 families have to be housed. Um, so that's two years and uh, that's 300,000 figure that um, she's plucked out the air, uh, is sort of disappears very quickly. What about all the roads that go into building housing. What about all the schools that have to be created, quite apart from the overstuffed schools we've got at the moment, mm. to, to fulfil all of that building? What about the <coughs> hospitals, uh, the GP surgeries, the shops? You know, it's very, very glib and very, very Angela Rayner to pluck this figure about housing. They're going to create this miracle of housing. But it's a massive thing. It's not easy to simply say, you can build it over there. Mm. You can build on that field over there. It's all right. Well, put the sewage in, put the electricity in, put the, all those other bits of infrastructure. And it's a massive problem. And where's this going to happen? It's going to happen on the green belt. Now, I'm afraid we have a big problem in this country with nimbyism, don't we? Yeah. We do really like to have a new housing estate. Sounds really good, as long as it's way over there mm. and nowhere near me and is not going to obscure my view. And, you know, we have to be seriously realistic. Michael Gove is a great politician, actually, but if he's at the point where he's struggling to make it work, uh, then I think anybody will struggle to make it work. Now, Sean, we can agree that these are good noises from Labour about building more houses. Build, baby, build. But what about the elephant in the room of legal net migration? Uh, well, it, it's a very legitimate conversation to have. Of course, it follows that not everybody involved in net migration are people, as it were, we don't want. We want people to come in and actually but work in our hospitals. they've got to live hospital. somewhere, is my we point. We want to come in and work in our hospitals and our <coughs> schools. There are how many vacancies in the UK at the moment? Unfilled jobs? Hundreds of thousands. We can go down that rabbit mm. hole. But the truth is, you still need homes for people who are here. So if we say the only thing we need to worry about is net migration and we'll just leave everybody else homeless, that doesn't but solve anything. But if it's half a million a year no, extra, no. then this, this ambition is, is a rather worthless well, one, isn't it? First of all, they are people who we are, in many cases, wanting to come into the country to take jobs because we haven't got people able to take them it's here at the moment. But that's a whole yeah. other debate. It distracts from the fact that we are not building even this government's target. They have been there for 13 years, uh, and at the end Neil. of the 13 years... They have failed to build I, I, the homes I we needed. Sean and, is... by the way, when Labour left government in 2010, we did not have 
anything like this crisis. I think in net I think Sean Neil is sidestepping the issue here. No, we're not. Cause this is a crisis that happened under the Conservative government. Hopefully, uh, my, my point the is, Labour Party what is, will clear what is it up. the point in a, an ambition of 300, 250,000 houses well, a year if net migration remains fact, Mark, at current that levels? You are now converting to our view, which is we need more homes. For sure. So no. let's have a, let's have a target have of 400 or 500,000 homes. But you and don't get more than 500,000 homes. But how do you by... do it, Sean? It isn't as glib as that. Well, you know, you it's a of... massive. Sean, it's a massive, massive. Uh, undertaking it absolutely needs doing you're completely right we we have all of these uh, people this 600,000 net migration are people who are coming here legally to fill all of those jobs that you're talking about it, it, I know nurses in uh, Trellisk Hospital in Truro in Cornwall who are effectively living in dormitories because there is nowhere to house them and you know they're here looking after people it but there's but Cornwall has a huge homelessness Neil, look, problem I, I'm not... London has a huge homelessness problem so it, there's no the point I'm trying to get at really is that there, there's no magical answer. It We're isn't in easy enough there's no to magic. simply say but we will build 300,000, even if they're able to do well, it. We need to build, but isn't it marginally ironic that Angela Rayner, who I believe is also in charge of the brief of levelling up, is suggesting building on the southeastern green yeah. belt where there are huge numbers of houses, huge numbers uh, of businesses, but surely it would be better to even out the investment across the country, that businesses start where the workers are as well as the other way around. That's so and true. If you could refocus so that there were attractive places for businesses to start outside the green belt, outside the, the prosperous southeast, that might have then an you... impact. But as it stands, we don't have the bridges, we don't have you're, the road layers, we you're, don't you're, you're, have the infrastructure, and we cannot change You're not this wrong, overnight. but then does it make any sense on? to cancel the HS2 line that would have taken people and those businesses? to the north. They're We've got a conservative government. Uh, as well, you all know. The, 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 I don't know. I'm sorry, I disagree. The north is not just between Manchester and Birmingham. Of course it's The north not. needs to go east-west. Uh, uh, it needs to have connections that get people from jobs to work, from their home, to the schools, not just but on a fast speed needs, train, which brings need, them south into London where there's the money already. Uh, okay, where people briefly. are living at the moment. And what's very, very clear... Okay is that, for example, the Greenbelt argument, very interesting one, Greenbelt is actually only around 10% of, of England. OK. 90% is not Greenbelt. Why are we not building homes, affordable homes, on those brownfield sites and allowing councils to buy the land, to buy the housing stock, okay. to give people homes to live in. And our teachers, that, our nurses, okay. our doctors. And on that, I agree. What's your view, Mark, at gbnews.com? We've got more papers next. See you in two. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Nightmare commute. Kick it up a gear with me, Patrick Christie's, at drive time, 3 till 6 p.m., Monday to Friday, on GB News Radio. You can listen online and on DAB Plus on the Smart Speaker app and on the GB News app. And if you've got an Alexa, all you have to say is, Alexa, play GB News. We're also on TuneIn and the Radio Player apps. From the school run to rush hour, get revved up with me, Patrick Christie's, on GB News and GB News Radio. Join me, Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner, Monday to Thursday, 9.30am. Who benefits from that? Yeah. Not the British public. And on Fridays, join us, Tom Harwood and Ellie Costello from Britain's Newsroom. That's what you get with this show, that's fantastic. If it's happening, we're talking about it on Britain's Newsroom. GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. 
people in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10am till noon on GB News, Britain's news channel. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the live desk on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi, on Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan Tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan Tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel. More papers in. Let's have a look at the Daily Mail. And they lead with pawns of merciless terrorists. A mother with babies in her arms, a woman with her two young daughters, a distraught boy of 10, just some of the 100 hostages stolen by murderous Hamas invaders. Uh, the Times, stunned Israel goes to war. Residents told to lock doors as gunmen stalk the streets. The Sun... Uh, a thousand dead in Israel crisis, a lighter story, a showbiz story, exclusive Simon Fury, Simon Cowell, David Walliams is a Wally, calls ex-pals writ, absurd and bizarre. The I newspaper fears grow for 100 hostages. Also, Reeves rules out any further tax rises. Daily Mirror, exclusive, Rachel Reeves, Shadow Chancellor, put your trust in me. Shadow Chancellor promises to boost spending power of ordinary families. Uh, I'll be looking after 9 to 11 tomorrow and Tuesday, and I'll be responding to Rachel Reeves's keynote speech at conference tomorrow and Keir Starmer's on Tuesday. You won't want to miss it. Um, still with me, my top pundits, Sean Woodward, Annunciata Rees-Mogg and Neil Wallace. And let's get your nominations for Headline Heroes and Backpage Zeros. So who's caught your eye today, Sir Sean? Well, my zero, I'm afraid, remains for this week. Uh, the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, for going to Manchester and announcing in Manchester that he'd be ending the high-speed rail link to Manchester. I thought that was an incredible piece of uh, zero timing. My hero uh, is this week at the London Film Festival, a movie being made about Sir Nicholas Winton, who, during the war, rescued 669 children who would have been exterminated by the Nazis. And a movie has been made by someone I worked with, James Hawes, who was on That's Life with Esther Ranson. Is he a, the, and novelist? James has made this movie. Right. Anthony Hopkins is playing Sir Nicholas Winton. And wow. it was on That's Life that Esther brought Nicholas mm, Winton into television. the studio is wonderful. and Isn't allowed him to meet all of those <clears throat> children, or many of them, who now as adults that he had rescued True and hero. he had never True met hero. them. What, what a great fantastic. nominee. And now it's a movie. Fantastic piece of uh, television, actually. He had no idea that everybody else... Oh, I remember that. Right. ...in the audience to his eye. were uh, yeah. people he had rescued. Yes, had no idea. It's an amazing moment. It's Wonderful. a viral, a viral video. Uh, Annunciata, your hero of the day. It is Mary Beard. Um, who I think it is absolutely wonderful. She has said that gossip is very important um, from a historical perspective and really that gossiping about Harry and Meghan is exactly what the Romans were doing back in the day. But I think it's really good news for all journalists um, that there is a, a really core <laughs> job you are doing to make sure the historical record is there. So many thanks. Well, I'm very <laughs> pleased that you're allowed to gossip about Harry and Meghan and maybe even indulge in a bit of harsh satire from time to time. No. Uh, what about you, Neil, your headline well, hero? Did we get your zero? Uh, we'll, we'll come to that in just a moment. Okay. Let's have your hero um, first. My, my hero is absolutely anybody carrying uh, a gun on behalf of the Israelis 
uh, in uh, what's happening there at yeah. that moment. Absolutely anybody who is You're fighting right. for the side of Israel. I agree. Has, in fact, you have been doing here brilliant, this evening. Brilliant nomination. Uh, briefly, if you can, Annunciata, your back page zero. Is Metro Bank. Um, Metro Bank has previously cancelled, for very woke reasons, lots of people's accounts, um, including the Brexit Party um, uh, and campaigners on children's rights. And I think that it therefore, you know, go woke, go broke. It's now looking for a buyer. I feel very sorry for the people who are worried about their money with it. You reap what you sow. Briefly, Neil, your back page zero. Uh, the story we've literally just been talking about, the BBC failing to call the Hamas terrorists terrorists. There you go. How hard can it be? Uh, look, to balance that out, the BBC will argue that they've spoken to correspondents around the world. They've interviewed people from across the political spectrum in the Middle East and they would argue that they've done everything to provide balanced journalism. Look, it's all about opinions. Thank you for yours tonight. And most importantly, thank you to Sean Annunciata and, uh, of course, to Neil. Really enjoyed our debates. Your emails as well. Well done to the team. Uh, Dominique Mescana and Ellen working so hard all weekend. Some difficult stories to cover. You've been brilliant. I'm back tomorrow at nine, looking after that slot temporarily. Headliners is next. Hello there, good evening. I'm Jonathan Vortry, here with your GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. After a mixed weekend, most of us will start off on a relatively dry, if cloudy, note for the start of the new working week. There is still some rain around across Scotland. It will gradually be pushing its way southwards into parts of Northern Ireland. We've got a freezing gallery, the Scottish borders, and over the far north England as well. Elsewhere, a largely dry night to come. A lot of cloud pushing into Irish Sea coastal areas. We'll turn quite misty and murky here, but a mild one for many of us. Temperatures not dropping much lower than 11 to 15 degrees. Celsius, so really quite a mild start to Monday morning. And we will see this thick area of cloud for Northern Ireland, Southern Scotland, Northern areas of England could bring some drizzly outbreaks of rain, easing off a touch into the afternoon. Some of the cloud across Irish Sea coastal areas again could linger throughout the day as well, but move further inland and there will be some sunny intervals to enjoy. Some wispy cloud around making the sunshine hazy at times, but temperatures noticeably above average for the time of year between 17 and 24 degrees Celsius. And the Tuesday, there is signs that the frontal system is going to start pushing its way in from the northwest, gradually sinking southeastwards as we head throughout the middle part of the week. So starts its way off across northwest Scotland, could bring some localised flooding in places. And on top of the rainfall that we've already had, there could be some disruption in places. So do just take care here. Elsewhere, again, throughout Irish Sea coastal areas across the channel as well, there could be a little bit of mist and fog lingering, but a generally fine day elsewhere. That rain, though, will arrive across central and southern areas as we head towards Wednesday and Thursday. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening, from across the UK and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the Live Desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes & Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate, both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> Michelle.